C. And my partner is Meredith Weiss, who is our Dean of Information Technology at UNC. We're going to be talking about outsourcing your IT, primarily talking about servers. Uh, to begin with, we're actually going to play game show for a minute or two. Uh, as many of you may have noticed, we did do a survey before this presentation. We had 25 different people respond. Uh, for what it's worth, 10 were from private schools, 15 were from, from public, 4 were from standalone uh, I, uh, law schools. And what we're going to do is just go through a few of the important questions, and the first person to guess the right answer will get a prize. So, on the first slide, what percent of the respondents do you think currently pay to outsource at least one item by choice to their larger college or university? 65%. Wow, first person to do it. 35% was right. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> What percent do you think currently pay to outsource at least one item to an outside to an outside vendor? Sixty-five. What did you say? Sixty-five. Yep. Gee, this must be easy question. First person getting it each time. And what percent of the respondents thought that we should keep everything possible in house? Forty-three. Fifty-three. Sixty-three. Fifty-three did it. What percent believe that most items should be evaluated for outsourcing? Sixty-three. Nope. Forty-three. Fifty-three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may not have the common answer, but I have the right answer. <laughs> you know, I've noticed that people from your institutions often think that. Way to go, Steve. I, I suppose I should explain, because it's an inside joke, my wife works at that same institution. So I'm unfortunately really familiar with people from Duke University. Uh, what percent believes that outsourcing leads to better service quality? What did I hear? 30%. Yep, 30% will do it. Okay. Uh, to start with, this is pretty much the standard thing. The goal for the IT department is to deliver the best IT value and service. Now, that's something we all share, but you have to keep in mind we're at a public institution. We have a finite amount of funds. Uh, our budget each year is decided by the General Assembly, usually in an overtime session because they never can make up their minds by July 1st when the fiscal year starts. And so money is an issue. There's no way around it. Uh, now, before Meredith arrived as Associate Dean for IT, the IT department was run by who? Not, not even an exempt employee. It was an hourly employee. They reported to an Associate Dean in the law school. Some years that meant that was somebody who knew something about technology. Somebody, sometimes it was somebody who was basically disinterested in it. And there wasn't anybody really in the law school who was a primary contact point for the rest of the campus to deal with for IT. At least nobody who was viewed as a person of authority. I guess the first question is why we want to outsource. Uh, the first thing we were looking at were the servers. Now, we, for a file server, we were using a combined Windows to Novell system. We had a single server with a tape backup. That meant if it was a software problem, we could restore by tape, up, by tape backup, but it was going to take a while. If it was a hardware problem, we had a problem, because we had no way of really getting everything back up online quickly. It scared us a little bit. If you notice in the photograph, uh, that funny little safe underneath that wooden table, for years and years, that's where the tape backups went. They weren't even being stored off-site. Now, for web servers, once again, we had a single box. It was just it was a Linux box. It was sitting in that room along with everything else in that mess. Uh, if it went down, you know, occasionally it got hacked into, we restored it by tape. 
We, soon after we had moved the law school's website off of this server, the library web server, library presence was still on there, and we had a hardware problem. One of the control boards died. To be honest, it was quicker. I moved the entire website off of, the entire library website off of this server onto the university servers because it was quicker. Because we simply didn't have enough manpower to sit down and diagnose the problem, get things mounted. Every time there was a problem, it was a major problem. We also had the difficulty of there really not being enough budget, mon budget money for a lot of IT staff. There's a finite number that the law school is going to be willing to have. Before Meredith came, we had two full-time folks. We had one part-time person who was dealing primarily with the servers, and we had one temp. Uh, when Meredith arrived, we lost both the part-time person and we lost the temp. Now, the school just isn't large enough to justify a large IT staff, at least not in the minds of the people who matter. This means that the staff do not have the time to gain expertise sometimes, or at least as much expertise as they'd like in new areas. We also have the problem that we're running out of space in the building. Uh, as we stand here, there are people packing up books on the fifth floor stacks of the library because it's going to be converted over to faculty office space. Uh, there's a storage closet, which is now a staff office. There is a small conference room that got converted recently to a staff office. And we just had a major addition six years ago. It's unlikely the General Assembly is going to let us start adding on to the building anytime soon. And of course, the fun part, we have all these younger faculty members coming in. They're interested in new technology. They're interested in new modalities. They want to do things. Uh, before Meredith arrived, we were reactive. We, it, the IT staff were just barely being able to keep up with demands as it was requested of them. Now we're actually able to look at things proactively. We can look at what we think people will want to do. We've also had growing interest in dis distance education. We're talking about trying to get our CLE online. Uh, we also, it's, it's interesting, we also have questions about streaming video and audio. And the fun thing is that some of these questions are actually coming from some of the older faculty now. Uh, they're being invigorated, I think, by the new faculty coming in. We have one woman who's asking about distance ed, who at one time was nervous using her computers. Interesting thing also is the institutional competitiveness. Now, in this instance, I'm not talking about competing with our friends over in Durham. We're not going to ever, technologically. I'm talking about competing with other institutions on campus. Uh, we have meetings where all the deans meet and they discuss issues. IT is one of the things they talked about. And our dean was being told about all these resources that were available on campus. And why we were paying to do it on, uh, in house if we could do it for almost nothing? That isn't entirely accurate, but it nonetheless brought up the questions. And once again, deans sometimes are very technologically advanced, and some really don't know that much about it. It's more of a headache, a thorn in their side, than anything else in their minds. And you have to remember, they don't understand the cost of infrastructure, and they don't really understand that the folks they have working in IT don't know every single thing. You know, in their minds, IT folks should understand all IT. But what we did was took the idea of outsourcing and viewed it, viewed it as an opportunity. You have to keep in mind, infrastructure is invisible. Uh, nobody in the law school knows really what a redundant server is. Few even understand what a server is. And few care until the day the servers go down. What we wanted to do was be able to redistribute the staff energies into areas that had more of an impact in the law school and that more people in the law school saw and reacted to. What we were able to do is get a lot more support for IT because what the law school faculty and staff are interested in is personalized service. What they really react to is somebody coming to their office and helping them with things or dealing with their problems. They're not interested in servers. 
That's why the uh, servers were relegated to that second floor room in the library that we looked at a little while ago. Now, part of it was, too, our IT staff were responsible for a wide number, a wide area of things, despite the small size. They have to deal with all of the hardware deployment in the, in the law school. They have to deal with software installation and support. They deal with supporting the listserv and the calendar and the email functions, even though those servers themselves are maintained by the, law, by the campus, somebody has to help the faculty with the applications. We also have to deal with handheld computers, with Palm Pilots, with Blackberries, all of the classroom technology, all of the video and sound recording, setting up sound <coughs> systems when we have speakers. Basically anything technological falls under the IT banner at this point in time. So what this was was an opportunity to free up resources for things that we were really more interested in. Uh, for one thing, when Meredith arrived, we were due for a major overhaul. Well, we were overdue for a major overhaul of our web presence. And the first thing she needed to deal with was that. Uh, we needed to be able to figure out exactly where we were going to put our energies. Uh, the clinics wanted to get in some uh, Case, thank you. Case management software. And the library needed to set up a proxy server because we have a certain number of databases that are available from the law library but that are not licensed to the entire campus. So we needed to set up our own server to deal with those. I, the thing you have to keep in mind is that law schools are relatively small entities. There's no way we're ever going to be able to provide all of the services that a much larger entity on campus can provide can often do. And it's a problem for the law school IT staff. If you wear enough hats, some of those hats inevitably become distractions. It's just not possible to deal with that wide a variety of things and deal with them all really well. So outsourcing with a larger department on campus was an opportunity. We got access to new, newer shared technologies and software. We ended up being able to use better hardware, we had a better knowledge base and expertise available to us. And we knew that the people dealing with, the, with our servers, that was their primary activity. They would keep things up to date and they would keep them secure. But when you're dealing with outsourcing, there are some major concerns. There's cost. Now, when you're dealing with an outside vendor, you have to keep in mind that they're there to make money. That is their primary interest. But they're taking all of those costs and they're spreading them out over a much larger client base than you can do. And that's even more so, even equally true for you know, a campus-based group. They may not be trying to make money, but all of the services they have, they're spreading out. It's a lot less expensive for them per user than it is just for the law school to do it. But there is a caveat in there. You have to make sure that you are paying for services that you need. Uh, getting a long list of services that are irrelevant to you or that you don't need, you don't want to be paying for those. Uh, it looks really nice on the uh, vendor's sheet, but you don't want to have to actually be paying for it. There's also a lot of management complexity involved here. You're going to have to deal with contracts. Contracts are a pain, but they are inevitable. You have to deal with the procurement process. You have to deal, especially if you're a public entity, probably with a bid process. And that can be a nuisance. When we were doing the case management software, we had one vendor drop out because he was insulted by the idea that we asked him to go to bid. He didn't even want to bother with the entire process. Writing a contract is an art, but you need to sit down and read those contracts. Uh, I know of one contract that went to the Duke Medical Center Library from a major vendor where they got confused when they were writing the contract and they had it backwards. They insisted that we were wrong until they sent it to their legal division who rather sheepishly apologized for the whole thing. But somebody needs to very carefully read those contracts. But we all work in a law school. We should be able to find somebody capable of doing that. We also have the problem Sometimes those contracts are going to be multi-year, 
And at least in our law school, we only know what money we have for one year. It's something of an act of faith for us when we sign a contract for two years, but it is sometimes necessary. Keep in mind also that everything in that contract is negotiable. We sometimes think that the uh, other party isn't interested, but from experience, regardless of the size of the party, they will talk to you about it if they want you to sign that contract. And of course, the fun part is enforcing the contract. Especially when you're dealing with commercial entities, you do want something in there about what's going to happen if there's failure to perform. You want to know what's going to happen if there's a financial failure upon the part of the vendor. Uh, as one of the people who responded to the survey pointed out, there's always a chance when you're dealing with a small vendor that somebody may die who's actually responsible for the for performance of the contract. All of these things have to be taken into consideration in that piece of paper. You also need to look at what's going to happen if the budget goes over contract. Who's going to be responsible? Uh, goes over budget. Who's going to be responsible for the extra money? And what happens when the contract goes over schedule? Uh, that isn't an, at all unusual. As we all know, the implementation may run late, but if it's going to be a problem, it should be written into the contract. You need to specify service levels. And you need to be able to specify a speed of response, who you contact if there is a problem, who you contact if that person is unavailable. There is nothing quite as frustrating as trying to call your contact at the vendors and find out that nobody bothered to tell you that they no longer work there or that they were on vacation for the next month. There's got to be something in there about backups, who's going to do them, when they're going to be done, how frequently, where they're going to be stored. And of course, there should be just general standards. Now, a lot of these things are less of an issue if you're dealing with an on-campus entity. Because, of course, if we have problems with somebody who's on campus, we can always go to the provost. Uh, there's always somebody higher up who we can uh, talk to who does have some influence over them. You also have human resource issues. You're going to have a loss of intellectual capital. Uh, the half-time person who left was our server person. We had people who had some experience with Linux, but truthfully, it was not second nature. So it was a lot more of an issue when the server went down than it was when Harry was still there. You're going to have to deal with the perceptions and the preferences of the staff. You're going to have people who like doing some of those things that you're going to outsource. Now, that isn't a breaking, you know, that, that isn't sufficient to break the deal, but it's something you need to at least take into consideration. You're also going to have to deal with, sometimes, finding new positions for staff who are leaving. For us, that wasn't an issue because one was a temp, and the other individual was already teaching full-time at a community college. We were just a side position, so it wasn't really that much of an issue for him when he lost the second job. You're going to have to deal with cultural issues within your institution. Outsourcing is a dirty word in some places. Uh, it's frequently done in universities when, in order to decrease benefits or to decrease wages for low-paid employees. And so when people hear that word, they sometimes have a knee-jerk reaction saying, we can't do that. And of course, so you are going to have to be concerned about whether or not your institution, just in theory, wants to support outsourcing. There's also a standard problem. IT folks like control. Uh, and you are going to lose some control over some issues. That's especially a question if you suddenly have involved your financial officers for the law school in this process. You want to make sure they understand that they are helping you and not telling you what to do. Uh, we're going to look quickly at where we looked for resources. We started out looking at administrative information services. Now, these are the folks who do the primary IT services on campus. They take care of the email servers. They take care of our Oracle, our Oracle calendaring, all of the network services. They take care of wireless on the entire campus. You can't do it yourself. You have to go through them. 
They take care of the campus help desk, the computer repair center, all of the telephone and video, all of the television and campus-wide services. And they did offer us an option. The law school could go out and buy a server, and they would add it to their server farm. They would maintain it. They would take care of the backups. They would take care of support. But they were only dealing with tape backups, which was not really that much of an improvement for us. And it was also simply the question of this was not really their primary role in life. It was not a major thing, a major part of their uh, mission. And so we would have been just one small cog in the wheel. The other group we looked at uses the acronym OASIS. It's the Office of Arts and Sciences Information Services. Now, they support 64 departments in the School of Arts and Sciences, both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level. Uh, as they put it, they put a personal face on technology services, delivering hands-on personal network and instructional technology support to the college community. They've got a staff of 43 people. Uh, they were offering all of the services to the College of Arts and Sciences that we wanted to offer to the law school. And they were really enthusiastic. They wanted to deal with us. It's, a, it's an advantage not only to us, but to them. Because the more people they have under their wing, well, the more I, a power I think they have within the university in dealing with people. It, having us with them was something of a bragging right, I think. Now, there were some key priorities in our choices. One was dependability. Our clients have to be able to get to their files. You can't tell law school faculty that they're not going to be able to get to their files for a couple of days because the server's down. So we needed to be sure that there was going to be almost no downtime. We were concerned about moving things into a networking environment, uh, whether or not we'd actually be able to have any problems getting at the files once the servers left the building. And initially, we did have some problems in order to We had some DOS-based applications that were crashing. The curious thing was, it turned out that it wasn't a problem with the servers. It was a problem with the networking and with the switches. And the AIS folks that we looked at earlier came in and cleaned it up once we isolated exactly where the responsibility was. We were also a little bit concerned about the server's going down and making sure we could do file access, so we set up all the computers for uh, offline. offline file access. It's been almost a year. We've never had to use it. We're actually, one by one, taking it off of the computers because it brings up strange little messages sometimes that concern our users. But it was a waste of time. It really didn't need it. It made us feel better. But at least what we know now is our servers are being well maintained. We were also concerned with accessibility. The faculty need to be able to access their files from their offices, from their homes, and from anywhere in the country. Uh, if one of our faculty members comes here to Chicago and is teaching for a semester, they want to still be able to get at their files back in Chapel Hill. Uh, at, with our current setup, they can get at their files, they can even, if they want to, access their own office computer. We are also interested in maintaining access to the people who are maintaining the servers. And one of the things that we did when we went with Oasis was we went to Blackberries for all of the IT folks. And it's on the same system as the Oasis folks. So if there's a problem with the servers, we can reach them pretty much anywhere in the country. And that includes the person who is the head of OASIS. So we get really good service. And in truth, the Blackberries make the lives of the IT, the IT, teams, IT staff a lot easier because they can reach each other within the building or within the campus without any problems. And of course, it's a university. We're constantly under attack. There are constantly people trying to hack in. They maintain really good security on our boxes. And the virus definitions, the OASIS actually maintains their own server for doing virus definitions. They get them up quicker than the main campus does. Now, we used to use tape backups. They're really slow. Uh, even the main campus, if you, have to, if you are using their servers, 
they'll get, they'll get your files back within the day. Now, working with Oasis, we were able to get redundant electronic backups. They do them off-site, and there is actually instant file restoration. Now, for the web servers, we needed to deal with APS and SQL because Meredith was going to be doing the websites, and she was used to a Windows environment. And, of course, the last priority is the standard one. We had to be concerned with exactly how much all of this was going to cost. So when we looked at it, we were able to do a list of pros for doing it in-house. One of the major ones was the hardware access. We could walk down to the second floor of the library, and there the servers were. It meant that as, even if the uh, network went down on the main campus, we could still get file access as long as the switches in the building were not affected. And of course, as I said before, we had control. If something broke, it was our fault which ideally should have meant it never broke, but we won't go there. But there were a lot more cons to going in-house. We were duplicating services that were available on campus, which if nothing else was not politically popular in our institution. We had limited IT staff, and it wasn't going to improve past a certain point. We couldn't do 24-hour monitoring the services because, once again, we had limited IT staff. We couldn't afford to do the SNAP server for doing the instant file re returns. We were stuck doing tape backups, which were time consuming and a nuisance. Uh, we had to update and uh, purchase our own hardware, which meant that it was perpetually obsolete. We had to do the server maintenance ourselves, which requires a level of expertise. We ended up spending, we would end up spending more time managing equipment and less time helping people. We'd have a lot less time spent for new initiatives. We couldn't afford to do a Citrix server for providing applications. And there'd be no real-time replication to a remote location. And let me pass it over to Meredith so she can deal with one of those issues I'm sure you're all interested in. Money. Issues money. Um, Basically, you know, as Steve said, I was charged with looking at what we could get on campus. What's available? Are we not using all the resources that are available? And I think the idea was, well, there's all these resources available that we're not using that are free or very inexpensive, and we're going to get them, and everything is going to be great and, and cheap. And, uh, and I think that the, what we found was great. Uh, it wasn't necessarily cheap. Um, but I don't think it was overly expensive. What you're looking at here is the cost of Oasis Services, or the College of Arts and Sciences, um, was $36,000. And in the sheet that I think is available here and will be online, uh, it breaks down exactly what that covers. Um, to basically buy servers and, and put them in the centralized IT department was, was $30,000. And then it was interesting for me to try to um, quantify what it was going to cost in-house um, if I was to try and to say, oh, this is what it would cost in-house to duplicate the services that we would get if we went with the College of Arts and Sciences, it would have been unrealistic. Uh, the, it would have been an astronomical cost for the staff and for the equipment. So basically that cost is just, okay, we're going to maintain the status quo and have some redundancy just so that we're not all in a panic. So then the question became, okay, there's a $10,000 difference. What, is, what would we get for that $10,000? And what costs would we avoid in the future as far as the hardware and software and additional staff? Um, and so what we chose to do is we chose to outsource with the College of Arts and Sciences, um, and that was a year ago. And some of the things that we got with Steve covered a lot of them. Um, this, the file space, the two-hour backup uh, that can be restored every two hours, every, every uh, file on the server is backed up. And that can be restored from an individual person's desktop or for faculty staff that are um, don't know how to do that, um, we'll, we'll do it for them, but we don't have to go back to tapes or anything like that. Then the data is further mirrored every six hours off-site. Um, they do all the server maintenance, they do the print services, they give us Citrix services, for those of you that are unfamiliar with that. It's um, basically an application server, <coughs> and I'm sure this happens to you, but you, you come across that the one or two faculty members need SAS, and then someone needs SATA, and then someone needs Photoshop, or, or student organization needs Dreamweaver. We would have to go and buy a license here or there and run around and install them. And then when that person was done, maybe uninstall it and install it on someone else's computer. Um, now we just give them directions to the Citrix site and, and they can use them at any time. And we don't, 
we don't pay anything extra for that. Uh, that's included in, in the price. Um, basically, it's a shared system of licenses, so we just um, use the licenses that are already there. It's concurrent usage. And if they see that we're using something more and more, they might ask us to contribute a few licenses, but nothing anywhere near the cost of actually running a Citrix server farm, which is very, very expensive and needs a lot of expertise. Um, antivirus. Um, they also have an SMS server that we're able to use. Um, we can use that for desktop reporting, making sure our licenses are in compliance, making sure people aren't installing junk on their computers that shouldn't be there. Um, we can push out applications through that um, interface, and a lot of times the applications that we need to push out, the College of Arts and Sciences has already packaged for us. Um, otherwise, they'll work with us to help us do that, but usually they can just give them to us. They do all the service pack deployments. Um, and then again, as Steve said, they have a tech team of 40. Um, they're acting as our uh, extension of our server support and desktop support even. If we have a question in our techs, there's only three of them in-house, don't know the answer, they pick up the BlackBerry, and within minutes they can talk to one of 40 people that hopefully will give them an answer quickly. So that's been very helpful. Um, one of the best things is the emergency response. Um, they're not a 24-hour-a-day shop, but they are a 24-hour day emergency response, which means we no longer are, which is wonderful. Um, if something happens in the middle of the night, they take care of it. Um, and we don't have to worry about on-call pay or any, any kind of issues associated with those. Um, over the past year, a couple of um, additional needs came up. One was uh, upgrading our fundware system, which is an accounting system from uh, a DOS-based environment to a Windows-based environment adding time matters, which is uh, a case management system. Um, we needed to install the world version, uh, world server version, which allows connection from anywhere. It's a web-based version. Um, and in our old environment, this would have been a huge challenge because both of them needed servers. Both of them would need to be backed up. The time matters also needed a SQL server and a web server. Um, there, we wouldn't have the staff in-house to support that, and at that point, as we had anticipated, we would have definitely had to bring someone else on board and increase the amount um, of hardware we were purchasing. So the $10,000 definitely disappeared really quickly there. Um, instead, what we did was we picked up the phone, we called them, they took care of the hardware, they took care of the software, they, did the, they talked with the vendors, they did all the installation for us, they did the backup, they do the application support. Um, you know, if it's beyond a basic question or if it's anything having to do with the servers, um, and we don't have to handle that at all anymore. So, effectively, what we've done is we've, for the less, of a, the less than a cost, I think, of one employee, we've transformed our department from being a staff of three to having almost the same capabilities as the largest group on campus with a staff of 40. Um, and there were some ancillary benefits. This is Iron Mountain. Iron Mountain is, a, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a it's a way of backing up to um, like a laptop or, or any computer really to the internet. Um, so if people weren't storing things to the network and they were storing things to a laptop or they borrowed a laptop, this was a way of backing it up so they didn't lose them, lose their materials. Um, we wouldn't have known about this if it wasn't for our partnership with Oasis. Um, they're the biggest department on campus. They hear about things first. We're the IT, uh, IT department at the law school. We hear, if not last, at least much later than everybody else. Um, now when things come to them, they come to us right away, so we get to test things early, um, and then they help us set it up and implement it. So this that we might have had to wait another year and a half for, we can do it the next month or two. Um, they also, because they're the largest, they get the, the fastest response from central IT. You know, if they have a problem, it's going to affect, as Steve said, 64 departments. And now we're one of the 60, I guess we're 65. So when something happens, we get a uh, the fastest, arguably the fastest response on campus now. Um, and finally, one of the other benefits that we got was that we now benefit from their list of contacts. They have a huge list of contacts uh, across campus, and you know, when we've had problems in the past it, that seemed unsolvable, now we call them and say, you know, I've had this problem. Who can I call that can really do something for me? And they put us in touch with that person, and the problem is resolved. We had a wireless issue that went on for well over a year, and it was solved in a week and a half. Um, we had a problem uh, accepting online payments. That was solved quickly, too. So um, that's been really, really helpful. Um, the other thing that we outsourced was the website. Steve talked a little bit about this. Um, we needed, 
well, one Linux box with no one to really watch over wasn't a good solution for us. Uh, we wanted something that would support ASP or ASP.NET and was backed up, and we needed SQL Server access. And um, it wasn't available at the time we were looking for this. It wasn't available on campus, and we started looking at local vendors in the area. And we were looking for someone that had been around a while, that was really an expert in this in this field, had worked with other UNC departments before. Um, and we found somebody that would do it for us for $60 a month plus the cost of a security SSL certificate. So that you can't touch. So, and that's been up, I think, over the past year. We were down with that, I think, about one time for about 10 or 15 minutes. And that was about it. So that's been really helpful. Um, so looking to the future and where we're, we're going with this. Um, what we're trying to do is really is to identify and, and be true to what our core competencies are as a law school IT department, um, making faculty, staff, and students' jobs easier. Um, and realizing, part of that is realizing what we're not or what we don't want to be. And we're not experts at server management. We don't have the funds, we don't have the staff, and we don't have the time. Um, so what our role is then following this policy is, is to find the experts in this area and partner with them. And that's what we've tried to do. And that's worked very well with, with this OASIS um, partnership. And it's a principle we're going to continue in things in the future. Um, we also had some internal ancillary benefits. Um, as Steve mentioned, we sort of got out of the business of the crisis management and the server management, which unfortunately is either negative or invisible. Negative meaning something's broken and everyone's upset or invisible. They don't realize that you're doing it. Not unimportant. I'm not saying it's unimportant. It's very important. Unfortunately, it's just, it's not rewarded well for the IT staff. Lose, lose. Lose, lose. Um, so what we did was by, by outsourcing this, our staff internally can now focus on being in front of our customers. Um, and starting to see more as a strategic education partner rather than, you know, someone that fixes your email when it's, when it's service crashing. Not that that's not a position too, but that we're really a strategic partner. And our, the staff has had more time now to focus on instructional technology and ease of use. And the faculty are starting to, to notice it. Um, since we didn't add the server support position that would have been inevitable, we now still have the staff of three. And I did a survey, and probably a lot of you responded for me, thank you, uh, about how big IT staffs are in law schools. And I think the uh, average was 6.8, just to throw it out there. So we have three. So it's, it's definitely an easy argument to say we still uh, need to expand our department. Um, and so what we've decided to do is add an instructional technology position, someone that can look towards the future as far as distance education, uh, distance CLEs, online learning, um, and focus on the classroom instructional support. And again, they're going to go through the same process. Analyze our needs, let's find out who the experts are, and let's work with them. I know, um, for example, there's been a lot of people expressing interest in narrated PowerPoint slides for, for classes and that sort of thing. And the College of um, School of Public, Public Health at UNC has been doing that for seven or eight years. So I think we're going to be working with them to see what is the best way to do it, what are your best practices, what potholes can we avoid from the beginning, how can we save money and, and not waste time. Um, and the last thing when looking into the future is just to mention that it, it, this has definitely been sort of a, a domino effect for us. Um, you know, we improved the, the, service, the server surfa, services, um, which gave the staff more time to do desktop support and help with instructional support. And that has seemed to improve faculty perceptions of IT, and they start to ask for more services. As they've been doing that, they've been giving for the first time, I don't want to say for the first time, but much more often, positive feedback to the IT staff, which means the world to the IT staff. They've come to me and they've said numerous times, so-and-so just said they're so happy about this, and they're so happy about that, and they're really recognizing what we're doing. And, you know, for as much as, you know, it's definitely a challenge when you're talking at the beginning about, okay, we're going to be shifting responsibilities a little bit, and it's definitely important to make sure everyone's on board and you're not, run, you know, running over somebody in the decision. That's come back really positive. At the same time, they've been going, the same faculty members have been going to the dean for the first time and saying, this is really great. We need to get on board with this, you know. 
And that's starting to move technology, believe it or not, out of the basement and into the boardroom, which is where it needs to be. And that's probably pretty common in everyday America, corporate America IT is at the strategic planning table, but sometimes that's a little slower to evolve in education. So that's definitely been a, a positive. Let me give it back to Steve to finish up. Okay. Just to quickly, yeah, we're going to have plenty of time for questions. To uh, quickly just go through the process, the first thing you end up needing to do is doing consensus building. You need to be able to go out and look and see what problems there are. You need to identify them. You need to evaluate them. This is somewhat complicated because it's not just a support issue. You need to look at what services really need to be done. You need to find out whether or not who is doing them, whether you are. There is the question of both of what you are currently doing and what you want to do, and also what your staff want to do. You may be surprised to find out which jobs they'd be happy to give up. You have to look at exactly what services your clients want, at what services a law school is willing to pay for. I mean, there are things that seem extremely important to me that the, de that the law school is simply not that enthusiastic about trying. And regardless of who we may think is right, they win. You have to look at what areas are going to be growth areas. And you have to look at what you're willing to give up. Uh, there is a tendency in IT to want to be able to do everything. And it simply isn't worth it. Uh, we were setting up a blog in the library. We used Blogger. It's really aesthetically <coughs> displeasing. I am not really happy with it. But it was the easiest, quickest option. And there was something valid to that. It was a, a good way of using the time and resources. At, when the day comes that we need something better, we can easily improve it. And of course, you have to look at what those services are really going to cost. And when you look at what they're going to cost, you have to look at everything. You have to look at the staffing, what the hardware, the software, the cost of telecommunications. I mean, it's even foolish things like adding more telephones, adding more voicemail, exactly what that space is going to cost you, just like in a business. Added cost of supplies, administrative costs, basically the whole thing that you would do if you were out there in the real world as opposed to in an educational environment. Once you do that, you actually need to deal with that consensus building within the law school. Uh, you need to talk to the faculty, to the staff, to the students, to the administrators. And make sure you do talk to the staff because it's curious. They frequently don't complain because they don't really think anybody's going to listen. But they often have opinions and they often have some valid contributions to make. You need to look at what services need help, what new services need implementation, and simply what really matters to your administrators and to your clients. In terms of the planning, you need to basically analyze your sourcing needs. You need to select the vendor really carefully. You need to negotiate the contracts, as we said. But you need to make sure that you involve enough people in the law school and you involve enough people in the IT department itself so that everybody has buy-in, so that they're all involved in the changes and they're actually willing to see them succeed. You want to make the implementation as painless as possible. You're going to have to allow for the fact that there will be time delays, there will be problems. Uh, we found the ideal time to do it was summer break, because there were the fewest number of people there to see the problems. And unfortunately, you need to plan on living there for a while. Uh, when we did the transition, one of the things we forgot to mention, when we did the transition, we had techs coming in from Oasis helping us convert all the computers. We had to bring all the computers in the law school into Windows XP, because that's what they wanted. And then we had to bring them all into their domain. Well, a bunch of us spent a weekend there, basically, at, at the end, just making sure everything was up and running. And an important thing is the assessment when you're done. You want to be able to look at it after the implementation and see what worked and what didn't work and how successful it was. And you need to be able to assess exactly how good the performance is of the vendor. Because that contract is for a finite length of time, 
and you're going to either want to, one, renegotiate the contract and its cost, or two, look for another vendor. But in any event, you're going to have to have some sort of standards that you're going to look at to decide what you want to be able to do. And like I said earlier, you don't want to pay for what you're not using. Uh, as an example, we, weren't, we have not been using Citrix that heavily. And the School of Arts and Sciences gave it to us for the first year. And they've informed us they're not going to charge us for the coming year because we aren't using it that heavily. But to be honest, it's really handy for me. I don't like having to uh, put Adobe Photoshop on people's desktops when I know it's going to be used three times a year. It just irritates me somehow. And I've managed to escape it using their Citrix server. Now, we are going to go into questions, but there was a handout. If any of you didn't get it, we have more copies. But just to tell you, what's on there is the website for going to the pre-conference survey. Uh, as promised, we did remove the identifying statements of folks, so you can see what everybody's answers were, but you can't see who answered what. There's a copy of the OASIS agreement. It's interesting, but do keep in mind that was an agreement with an on-campus entity, so it's not quite as nasty as one with a commercial group. Uh, there is OASIS statement of what services they gave, give us this year, gave us this year, which we thought might be interesting. And there are a few articles, mostly from Educause, about outsourcing. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? I have a question now. Uh, in fact, we, we're kind of like a hybrid. We work a lot of most rooms for that. But we do have some like off-site backups and things like that up the main campus and that. So we're migrating our email to the main campus, et cetera. Now, the other thing I find is most of the time it's a very good relationship. But there's times, you know, I'll say they are great at doing day-to-day -day stuff. But when you have an unusual circumstance, or you do run across that's out of the ordinary, it is a pain to get it taken care of. Now, do you find any kind of problem with that, uh, with the outsourcing? We have not been having that difficulty. Uh, they've actually been extreme, extremely responsive. But we've also put a lot of effort into maintaining the relationship. Uh, curiously enough, they had a going away party recently for, one, for the person who worked with us. They actually invited us to it. Uh, we try to maintain a relationship as closely as we can. I'm just to, to add, you know, I understand that that could, could be an issue, and that's one of the things that we think about it, is that we've worked really, really hard to build a relationship with them, including, you know, almost as if we're in the same department. You know, we go out to lunch, you know, maybe once every other month. You know, we do the, the cards, and, and when I get uh, gifts for the IT department for uh, holidays, I'll get, not for 40 of them, but for the ones that are involved, you know, uh, with us there, and we've worked pretty hard to do that. I think that it will be a challenge for us as people transition, the people that, we've, that we work with initially leave, and we have new people there. But I think because it's the College of Arts and Sciences and it's so big, um, we, we really don't run into too many of those problems. Yeah, I'll take a more point. We have, uh, uh, we do have a very good working relationship with the campus. A lot of times we have a company. Sometimes we'll run across a situation that I know how I would handle it. I don't know what I would do. So you go to them and say, well, we need this done. And they go, well, we can't do this. Do we clear through this? And we've got to go through this red tape. And that's got to be approved by someone. So, so what would take me five minutes to do takes them two days to get it done. So I think then if you're going to work with someone, if, if you have a choice, then you need to have, as part of your service level agreement, some sort of expectation on, on turnaround for some, some items like that. That would be my only thought. Do you have another? No, because in all truth, there are things that we use the main campus for. Uh, in email, for example, they irritate me to death. Uh, but some things are simply non-negotiable to them, and I've simply learned to live with it. Uh, for example, the library can't set up a uh, email address just to the reference desk. They will not set up an email account that is not attached to one individual, and they will only set up one email account per individual, which means I have this massive list of shared mail folders sitting in my email. Because it was, but to give them credit, they did give me an alternative and a way to get around it. It just wasn't the one I want. I would have chosen. Well, see, that's 
say it matters what they do. Mm -hmm. I know where they see that. I know some of these things can be done. And, and if they say, well, we can't do this, we can't do that, we had, when we first got on the active directory, we got on the organization, hey, this is a great idea. And they thought we were going to have to physically assign every IP address. You know, I said, and all, all the other places on campus started to sign IP address, we had the power weapon. And truthfully, strangely enough, our relationship with Oasis has made it easier for us to deal with the rest of campus because we are grouped with them, and when we have a problem, they will help us discuss it with the powers that be. So for us, it's actually been an advantage. Yes. Anybody else? We're looking at the exact same thing. We're, the decision has been made not by uh, the people on the ground floor, but at a higher level. And so the people on the ground floor have to implement it now. But we've run into resistance in the past um, where questions like applications, they will not support and they will not install. And I, I, it sounds like Oasis is, a, is an amazing unit at UNC that is providing services that campus IT either wasn't providing and now doesn't have to worry about. And what we have is we have a one-size-fits-all model um, that's not based on academic computing. Uh, it's based on you know, uh, administrative computing. And their models don't fit us. And their client base now are other administrative departments. And so when we talk about having to have access when we have class, which could be 10 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and those things, how do you get a campus entity to, to acknowledge the value of those schedules, because you can't sue yourself. One and way the provost might not be interested in this sort of, you know, interdepartmental just to squabble to them, but to us, that's a service threshold that must be there. They may not pay attention to one department, but if you were to group with some of the other departments, uh, we were we mentioned the uh, school of public health earlier when we were talking about e-learning, and the campus was not interested in setting up a Breeze server. Uh, the School of Public Health went out and got the money to buy one. But they set it up with the School of Social Work, with the School of Nursing, with the Health Sciences Library, with the School of Library Science. Uh, we're talking to them about it. There are several other groups. Aside from bringing the price down for them, they are assuming that if they bring enough people in, sooner or later, they'll get the main campus to take it over. Because they don't really want to keep it either. I think a lot of it is just being political enough to deal perhaps with other departments that have the same issues and having the deans in those schools also involved in requesting help. Have you found that your group, the three of you, <laughs> uh, have become a resource for other people in Oasis? Somewhat. Somewhat with different... Um, sorry. Somewhat. Um, I don't want to say um, that much, but there are a few things that, that we do that they don't do. Um, and sometimes, you know, when we were having, you know, when we went to, for example, Service Pack 2 and they had a group, I mean, they have 40 people, but they're not all working on that one issue. So they might have two or three people, and we have our two or three people. So we do collaborate back and forth that way and, and try to find the best solutions that way. So that, that helps. That helps, too. But they definitely give a lot more than we can. <laughs> There was actually a $10,000 fee the first year for bringing up the servers and helping us set up. Uh, but in all truth, they earned it. So the plan for the server hardware at $8,000, you had to pay that $8,000 every year? Yes. We pay, well, we, I mean, it's not, it doesn't, 
Right now it doesn't break down like that, but basically, yes, we have a contract with them, $36,000 a year for uh, hardware and server support and file services. Yeah, doing it in-house was a little bit stranger because the difficulty was that we needed at least two more boxes. We needed to change our backup system completely because it was time-consuming. We were using old tape backups. Uh, and some of the hardware was simply getting old. But it was. It's, it's almost like hiring another employee, but an inexpensive employee. You know, so it is a yearly cost. It sounds like it was a lot less expensive than hiring a full-time employee with benefits. And sure, if you put a full-time employee with benefits and then add our servers and then all of a sudden bring in the SQL server and time matters, I mean... And, and truthfully, as I said earlier, there's even questions of space. Yeah. Uh, you did this with, with, another office. When Meredith came, the I, I think the IT... No, I guess just before Meredith came, they moved the IT staff into a decent office. But for the longest time, they were in this narrow little sliver of a room that I think the architect put into the new wing with the idea that they'd be doing distance education in the classroom next door. And that was intended to be the room like the one in the back of this one. <laughs> but there were three people stuffed in there. You know, they were just low men on the totem pole. Do you have a financial penalty built in here for their lack of performance? Or? Yeah. Again, because it was an on-campus group. But you're still giving them money. We're giving them money, but... Uh, we kind of went through a discussion, basically, with our dean and their dean, just, um, or our senior financial dean, um, about how involved we wanted to get. Did we want to write out every single thing that they were going to do, or could we kind of build, these are the general outlines, we're going to have a trusting relationship. I mean, the one thing that we insisted was that the contract was uh, multiple years, and there was a cap on how much they could increase it year to year. Um, but that was pretty much the only thing we did. And we have the right, of course, to cancel. You've got other incentives that one can apply to a campus organization that you could sure. use on a third party as well, like especially reputational things. Right. right. Yes. Okay. Um, it would depend. I mean, if it was something really advanced, uh, we would work with them. If it was something in-house, we would probably just, you know, put it on a, a box in our, in our house and play with it. And then when we were ready to run with it, we would say, hey, can you run this for us? It, it depends on the need. I guess if it was something that we needed some kind of SQL server and, and we needed them to run it for us, they're, they've been pretty flexible as far as they'll put it up, let us try things out, and then whatever we purchase, you know, it's a, if it's above and beyond our contract, then we'll negotiate that separately. And, and truthfully, you know, they, they actually are the group that test a lot of things for the main campus. Uh, the reason I got that connection software, which is actually a trial for my remote on my laptop, was because the new head of uh, AIS was doing a project last year when he came, and his laptop died, and he lost his files. But the people he has setting up the server and testing it is Oasis because he apparently felt that they were in a better position to actually find volunteers and deal with it. Um, one final thing is, we did set up a blog that um, some people, or I think one or two people, posted some things before we came, and it's still out there, so if any other thoughts come up or questions, you can feel free to contact us individually or put it on the blog and we can kind of share ideas. <laughs> one last, okay. Is main campus computing uh, larger than Oasis? Um, main campus computing when we started this was two separate groups and was looking for a CIO. Since then they've combined under the new CIO and I think that what the plan is really is that Oasis is going to start working with them to, you know, again, they've, they've put this infrastructure together and I think they want to work with the main campus to sort of pass it off to them, which is another good reason why we feel we're on board with them. They're kind of working together about the size, I would imagine, I think that ITS has 500 employees, so oh. it's a lot. It's a lot larger, but that's not. I mean, that's everything. That's not academic. Oasis is the biggest academic computing environment. So.